Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon, and what happens is today we're looking at Did anyone ever really escape Alcatraz? I have a feeling no one did, right? And I don't know if it's a... I don't really know much about this. That's what what happens here is Katie has written me a script. I've got it in front of me right now. I'm going to read it. I'm going to add some comments if I feel like it. And then our wonderful uh, video editor, Jen, is going to... uh, Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, she's going to add some pictures and images and all sorts of stuff like that. And then if you're just listening to it, you're going to get some nice audio stuff. And... Like I always say, don't, you won't miss out on the pictures. I'll paint a picture in your mind with my words. <laughs> it's like probably overselling it a little bit there, Simon. Um, all I know about Alcatraz is, and it's probably an urban legend, but didn't they, were they, they were like the only prison to have hot showers because then the prisoners would all be really warm and they wouldn't want to try and swim uh, across the, the like sea or bay or whatever it is to the mainland. Um, but I, that's, that definitely sounds like one of those things that you see on like a fact video or like some fact website online that it's like two minutes of fact checking. You're like, oh no, that was, that's a lie. Anyway, let's just jump into it today, shall we? Uh, if you're uh, listening to this as its podcast form, as I always say, if you want to leave me a review, that would be most welcome. And if you're watching on YouTube, maybe it's a little bit early, but if you felt like smashing that like button already, maybe you're like, this is brilliant. I love introductions. I love overly long introductions on YouTube. I'm going to hit that like button. Thank you. Let's go. Prison cells, an isolated rocky island, freezing cold waters, and man-eating sharks. There's no man-eating sharks. Is this it? Alcatraz, 90% certain, 99% cer- certain, is in like that bay in San Francisco, right? There's no sharks there. Are there? It's no surprise that Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was where the troublemakers, the bad apples, the worst of the worst were sent. Al Capone, Whitey Bulger, Machine Gun Kelly, no not that one, the original one, all served time on the small island. Yeah, I'm vaguely aware that there's a musician called Machine Gun Kelly. I got paper cards. And people make fun of him? Is his music particularly bad? Of course I don't know his music. But uh, I know people make fun of him. With a reputation as America's strongest prison to uphold, the guards made sure that the inmates served their sentence as in barren cells or solitary confinement. No one would be smart or maybe stupid enough to try and escape, as if they managed to get out of their cells, they would still have to escape the heavily guarded prison and reckon with over a mile of the rough waters of the San Francisco Bay. To this day, nobody has officially been given the title of having escaped from Alcatraz. But is that really the case? Oh, we're going into cover-up territory. I mean, this is one where there's a strong motivation for a cover-up, right? Because if someone did escape from Alcatraz, it's not going to look good for Alcatraz. You want everyone to believe that you can't escape from it. Even if, like, you'd be like, well, the prisoners would notice that someone's missing. You just, you definitely do misinformation. Be like, no, 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 they died in the sea. They were eaten by a man-eating shark and froze to death, both at once, in pieces. Alcatraz. Here's a brief history of Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, or The Rock, if you prefer. Although, please note, I'm not going to be referring it to, uh, to it as The Rock going forward, as I don't want to sound like a total douchebag. <laughs> the Rock! Also, it'd be very confusing, because you might confuse it with uh, The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I don't think anyone would do that, but... Uh... Anyway, let's move on. The name Alcatraz came from European explorers mapping the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1700s and is believed to be derived from the old Spanish word for pelican, as presumably it used to have loads of pelicans on it. It doesn't anymore. The United States officially got their hands on it in 1846 when John C. Freeman bought it for £5,000, or about $150,000 today, adjusted for inflation. That'd be a bargain. (laughs) Even adjusting for inflation. £150,000. I don't think that buys you like a parking spot in San Francisco. I really don't know if that's a good deal for a 22 hectare, 9 acre rocky island covered in pelican poop, but it certainly didn't turn out to be a good idea for Freeman, who totally got screwed over by the US government when they decided it would make a good place to put a military fort. Tell you what, if someone offered me Alcatraz for $150,000, I'd be like, yes, 100% yes. I once met someone who lived in San Francisco, and I'm not entirely sure, but I'm fairly sure they were renting their apartment from like a landlord or whatever. And they just wanted to go traveling. They were like, no, I've had enough of work for a while, so I'm going to, I met this guy in Europe. And I'm just like, you know, oh, what, you know, what do you do? How do you afford travel to travel around Europe and stuff? This is all rather nice. He's like, oh, I just rent out my rented apartment in San Francisco on Airbnb. (laughs) Because apparently you just can rent an apartment on Airbnb and turn a profit. And I'm like, that's crazy. And then he told me how much rent was in San Francisco. And I was like, well, I mean, or just Airbnb in San Francisco. It's like, well, I guess I'm never going there. 
They paid him zero dollars for it, and even after decades of legal wranglings, his family was never able to claim a penny back from the sale. Well, that is a douchebag move, government. I'm sure there's like, isn't it called eminent domain, where the government could just take your property and be like, that's ours now because we're building a highway. But they have to pay you for it. I'm fairly sure they have to pay you for it because, as you know, I don't think the government's that much of a dickhead anymore. The West Coast's first lighthouse was built on Alcatraz Island in 1854, and the first soldiers arrived at the fort in 1858. Not long after, military prisoners and Civil War POWs started being held on the island, and by 1868, Alcatraz had officially switched from being a military defense outpost to being a detention center for military prisoners. In 1909, the main recognizable cell block was built as well as a new lighthouse tall enough to be seen over the new buildings. In 1934, Alcatraz was designated as a general federal prison, and in the following 29 years that it was open, it was home to over 1,500 prisoners as well as the prison staff who lived with their families on the island too. That's kind of got to suck, right? Uh, you got to live on the island? I mean, like, can't I just commute by boat? It's not that far from, like, the San Francisco shore, is it? Is it in the bay? I really think it's in the, there's a bay in San Francisco. I feel like it's in the bay. Did we say that already and did I already forget? Alcatraz seemed to be a weird mixture of ultimate punishment and relative comfort, with men sent there who were considered too much trouble at other prisons, but once there, they had the luxury of individual cells and pretty good food compared to the rest of the prison system. It had a capacity of 336, but the most prisoners it ever held at one time was 302. Whenever I hear about prisons, it's like they always seem to be over capacity, but like not by small amounts. It's like, yeah, yeah, we built this prison. It's supposed to house a thousand people, but there's five thousand people in it. And it's like, that's just, I mean, it's probably an over-exaggeration, but also might not be. Prison, like, over, prison sounds bad enough. Overcrowded prison just sounds horrible. That's not to say that it was a fun place to be, of course, although the practice was only used in the 1930s under Warden James A. Johnston. Inmates were routinely subjected to a rule of total silence and only allowed to talk to each other during recreation periods and to order food at mealtimes. This did nothing for their mental health, and many prisoners ended up using their cell's plumbing pipes as rudimentary telephones when the oppressive atmosphere got too bad. The rule was said to have driven men insane, and one inmate supposedly chopped off some of his fingers to get a transfer. God damn. I mean, this is like that one thing. I always, th I'd always think like, yo, if I was going to prison, I'd be like, I really want to be in solitary because I don't want to hang out with all the other prisoners. Like, even if like you get sent to prison for murder, I'd be like, I don't want to hang out with the other murderers. <laughs> that sounds scary. I murdered someone who was weak. I can't murder other murderers or stand up to them. I'd be like, can I go to solitary confinement? But apparently, it's horrible. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I really want to hang out with the murderers just because I need someone to talk to. <laughs> the risk of getting stabbed is is better than solitary, which to my in my mind is like, that's insane. Can't I just read some books or just look at the wall? <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, I'd just rather look at the wall than hang out with the murderers and risk being murdered. Um, but apparently not. Apparently people really don't like solitary confinement, which is why it's a punishment. Anyone caught breaking the rule was punished with solitary confinement. Well, there we go. In one of the prison's notorious D block cells, what was known as the dungeon, the underground remains of earlier buildings. Once tales of this treatment eventually started filtering out, this simple rule of silence was considered so inhumane that the U.S. Attorney General wanted to shut the whole prison down. Well, that's okay. Just let them talk to each other. Be like, yo, warden, you're fired. You're a bit sh. That's crazy and inhuman. And the prisoners can now talk to each other. We don't need to shut down the prison, do we? Warden Johnson agreed to relax the rule. How did you keep your job, Johnson? Re relax the rule, and by 1940, prisoners were allowed to hold conversations whenever they wanted, albeit quietly. I think the quiet conversation is a good idea. Like, if you're shouting, that's punishable. Because I feel like then, without shouting, things don't tend to escalate. The calls, in my opinion... Yeah, the cells in Alcatraz were small, but as we said previously, single occupancy. In the main block, they measured 5 feet by 9 feet, it's 1.5 by 2.7 meters, and were only about 7 feet or 2.1 meters high. That sounds, I mean, better than I expected, which is kind of intense. They consisted of three solid walls, with the front wall being the cell door. As these were made of bars, there was no privacy in the cells, which also had a toilet, small basin, desk, and bed squeezed in. There wasn't a way for inmates to individually pick the locks on their cell doors because there weren't any locks. The doors were operated by levers at the end of the row of cells that the prisoners couldn't reach. All of the cells were enclosed inside the prison itself, meaning that none of them had a back wall leading to the open air. There were gun galleries at each end of the rows of cells, and guards regularly patrolled the main corridors, which were ironically named after famous streets such as Broadway 
and Park Avenue. Outside, too, there was a strong guard presence with lookouts for both prisoners and also to make sure that unidentified craft on the water didn't come within 300 yards, that's 274 meters, of the island. And what about the man-eating sharks patrolling the waves just waiting for someone to try their luck? There are sharks in the San Francisco Bay! Really? With the most common being the not at all dangerous leopard shark. Okay, yeah. Because, I mean, you have those sharks and it's just that they don't all bite. I mean, I guess they bite. They don't all bite people. And all, uh, you could also just spread the rumor, right? Like, this was back in the day before the internet. You can't look it up and be like, there's no sharks in the bay. Someone could just say, yeah, prisoners, there's sharks in the bay. They would eat you alive. And you'd be like, okay, I guess so. <laughs> Better not risk it. The rest are small and generally stay at the bottom of the water. Great whites don't venture into the bay that often, although they have been documented passing through. Salmon sharks, which look pretty similar to great whites, are more common in the area, but do not have a history of attacking humans. Either way, it seems that any tales of shark-infested waters around Alcatraz have just been hugely exaggerated to add to the mythos of the inescapable prison. The water by itself is a far more dangerous proposition than meeting a shark. It's cold and has strong currents that would quickly tire out inexperienced swimmers if any of the inmates did attempt to swim to freedom they'd have over a mile to go yeah which you could do like swimming a mile it's pretty long i guess it's going to be pretty cold yeah it's going to be pretty tough look having this having the prison on the island is better than having the prison on the land i guess unless it's in like the middle of the desert or something isn't that like adx florence the one where they keep like the unabomber and stuff that's in the middle of nowhere right so even if you escape it's like where are you gonna go it's just miles and miles of nothing. Escaping the Rock If many people, some known to be habitual jailbreakers, are sequestered away in an apparently inescapable island prison in the middle of the sea, you can bet your life some of them are going to try and escape, even if it's just for the kudos. Officially, nobody has ever escaped from Alcatraz. Then argue, I would argue that this is just semantics. What does escape actually mean? Well, it means like you manage to get away, like because aren't all prisoners like if you escape prison prison you're almost always recaptured like 24 hours later the police pick you up because you did something stupid i was reading a story and it was just the guy escaped prison and the first thing he did was went home it's like bro i i mean kind of a double bluff in a way because if i was the police there's I mean, there's no way i'm sending guys to this guy's home he's not going to go to his home but I guess they did because they picked him up at home and sent him back to prison. But that does count as that does count as escaping prison. You just got put back in prison later. If you made it, if you got away, I'm saying from the prison system. Like if you got to the shore and were escaped for 24 hours, you 100% escaped prison. If you got to the shore and were captured immediately, you didn't escape prison. We'll go over some attempts in a minute, but surely if a prisoner prisoner managed to leave the island, that counts as escaping, even if they re were recaptured or died. Uh, it depends where they died. If they died in the swim, I don't think they escaped prison. I would say escaping prison is getting to shore and running off. The authorities are sticking by it, though, and they just concluded that in the most contentious escape attempt, the man merely drowned. Don't worry, we'll be coming back to that one. It's kind of the whole point of the story. First, let's look at a few of those other escape attempts. In all, 14 attempts were made over the course of Alcatraz's 29 years as a federal penitentiary. That's almost two a year, which is pretty good going for a place with such a fearsome reputation. The first escape attempt happened in 1936 when Joe Bowers just decided that he had enough one day and started climbing the prison's chain link fence. After ignoring warnings from guards, he was shot and fell down to the shore below, dying from his injuries. Yeah, well, that guy definitely didn't escape. <laughs> like, dude, what are you doing? Why are you even trying this? <laughs> but like, get down or we'll shoot you. No! Well, now you're shot and dead not an escape. He made it over the fence, though, and even with his totally low rent low rent approach, it counts as an escape in my book. Oh, Casey and I are not on the same page with that one. Climbing over a fence and getting shot while just because you got over the top. I mean, if you're a guard, you'd wait till he gets over the top. Or like, wait until he gets to the top, right? Because you're like, well, let's not shoot him until he's actually made. Oh, okay, he's over the bang bang. You know, you're not going to shoot him early. You're going to shoot him at the last possible moment, hopefully, because then you're not a horrible person. It's like, yeah, he's starting to climb the fence. Shoot him. Just shoot him now. That guy touched the fence. Shoot him. The first people to brave the waters were Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe, who succeeded in 1937 in breaking out through a window of a building they'd been working in. Unfortunately, they picked a bad day to do it as there was a storm happening at the time and the waters would have been treacherous. Their bodies were never recovered and they are presumed dead, which I think I agree with in the circumstances. Unless, unless they made it ashore and actually escaped. 
seems very unlikely. The award for my favorite escape, escape attempt goes to John Giles in 1945. For his prison job, he worked at the loading dock, and one of his tasks included unloading army laundry that was being sent to Alcatraz for cleaning. Eventually, Giles managed to steal enough pieces of clothing to make up a full army uniform, and one day he got dressed up in it and stowed away into the army boat heading back to the mainland. That is genius. I mean, it's it's very simple, but I love it. It's like catch me if you can style. Or he so he thought. Unfortunately, the boat didn't go to San Francisco, but rather to Angel Island, another small island in the bay. Because Giles's disappearance had already been flagged, a speedboat had been dispatched to bring him back. He managed to disembark the army boat, but his uniform wasn't quite right, so his cover was quickly blown. He was recaptured and returned to Alcatraz. Ah, uh, again. I don't think that counts as an escape. He didn't make it far enough. It's kind. Of, I see why this is like not black and white, but it's like you didn't. That's like climbing the fence. Getting on the boat is like climbing the fence. You didn't you didn't get away and then were recaptured. You basically never got away. The final escape attempt before the prison was closed was in December 1962. John Paul Scott and Dar Parker climbed out of a basement window and headed for the water. Parker managed to break his ankle during the escape and was quickly apprehended on some rocks nearby, but Scott tried to swim to freedom. He had fashioned some rudimentary buoyancy aids by blowing up some washing up gloves that he was about uh, and that was about as prepared as he had gotten. He was at the mercy of the currents and the cold water, and wasn't found for about two hours when some teenagers found him washed up and unconscious under the Golden Gate Bridge. Holy crap, he survived? Again, this sounds like a successful escape to me. He made it out of the prison, off the island, and to the mainland, whether by swimming or by sheer luck, he still made it. He was taken to hospital and once recovered, was sent back to Alcatraz. That's, in my opinion, that's the closest we've gotten to an escape. But he failed to escape. You it's like he lost consciousness while swimming to shore and was immediately apprehended. He didn't make a break. He just he just didn't. He 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 failed immediately. <laughs> Nowadays, there are regular swim events to and from Alcatraz with the youngest person to swim there and back being nine? God damn. Nine-year-old Simon would not have been into that sh**. The oldest person to make the swim from Alcatraz did it on his 87th birthday, so it doesn't seem like that much of a big deal after all. Okay, so now we'll move on to the most audacious escape of them all and the mystery surrounding the outcome. It's time for Frank Morris and the Anglin Brothers. The Great Escape I don't know if you've seen the 1979 movie Escape from Alcatraz starring Clint Eastwood. Ah, Katie, how little you know me. Of course I haven't. I have not, but it's also worth pointing out that while it's based on this escape attempt, it's also dramatized. Dra tra dramatized. Thank you, big brain. So it's not a totally accurate version of the events. It's also worth saying that there is no 100% totally accurate version of events. While it's been possible to work out various aspects of the escape, once the inmates reach a certain point, nobody can say for sure what happened next. Indeed, much of the detail was provided by only one man, Alan West, who I thought was called Alien West for a second, but no, it's Alan with two L's who might have been hyping up his own level of importance in the plan or just telling people what they wanted to hear to gain some sort of respect or leniency on his sentence. With that being said, let's get into what probably happened. This escape, number 13 out of the 14 attempts, was by far the most well thought out and well planned. Which honestly isn't saying a lot because most of the other guys is like, what was the plan? Well, we're just going to climb over the fence. What was the plan? Well, we're going to swim to shore. The guy with the army uniform plan, that was pretty good, but it also kind of fell into his lap. Serial near do well and actually very intelligent person Frank Morris was the leader of the group along with the brothers John and Clarence Anglin, who were known for previous escape attempts at other prisons, and the aforementioned Alan West. Frank Morris and the Anglins did already know each other from previous jail stints, so were familiar with each other's very particular set of skills. Sounds like some Liam Neeson sh I have a very particular set of skills. Isn't that that's he does say that right in that uh, those Taken movies are a very particular set of skills. The Anglins were in adjacent cells, which was not an unusual arrangement for the sake of keeping the peace. And Morris and West were also next to each other. Over the course of several months, starting in December 1961, the group used things such as old saw blades that they'd found and other makeshift tools, and managed to dig out and enlarge the vents in the back walls of their cells. They worked on these every evening from about 5:30 to 9 p.m., with one sawing away and the other as a lookout. As the holes got bigger, they covered them over with painted cardboard. I love. I have to say, there is something super fascinating about prison escape right like these guys just gr all they've got to think about all day doesn't you know you're in prison what else are you gonna do sit in the cell and think of ways to escape um it, it's just i don't know why it's so interesting but it is 
If you remember from earlier, I said that all of the cells were housed inside the main wall, so chipping through wouldn't lead you to the outside of the prison. That's true, but what the cells did back onto was, na- was were narrow utility corridors, which were closed at both ends and not patrolled. Once they successfully broken through to the corridor, Morris and the Anglins, who now sound like a 70s music group indeed, started working on breaking through events that led to to the roof. To help their work go faster, the men came up with all sorts of ingenious tools such as drills made from electric hair clippers and vacuum cleaner motors, but these ended up either being not effective enough or just a bit too loud to use. Yeah, like old school vacuum cleaners? Oh my god, extremely loud. This is really some prison break stuff. Like, uh, not like, obviously, this is a prison break. Simon, well done, you big brain. I mean, like the show, you know, where it's like a super elaborate escape from prison. We did, was it this? Maybe it was a casual criminalist. I did, a, this is another podcast they do, a casual criminalist. And uh, the guy kept escaping from jail, but it was super simple. His wife just flew a helicopter in and just picked him up. He grabs on and off they go. And then it's like season 17 of prison break. Michael Schofield's like up to some crazy ass shit that just seems wildly unnecessary. Just get get someone you know to have a helicopter mic. Come on. In another strand to this plan, the group had also managed to amass a large number of prison raincoats, either as donations by other inmates or just by nicking them. They had over 50 raincoats, which, by using purloined glue and hot air vents to seal them, they managed to make into a 6 foot by 14 foot or 1.8 meter by 4 meter raft. That is pretty clever. There was even enough left over to make some pretty sweet life jackets. <laughs> Just that is the last thing I'll be thinking about. Yeah, we're gonna escape from prison. We're gonna build a boat. Don't forget the life jackets. It's like I can swim. It's like we're not leaving without the life jackets. Safety first. They should have told that to the guy who tried climbing over the wall. <laughs> Safety first. When they say they're gonna shoot you, just stop climbing over the wall. They were working on and stashing all of this stuff above their cells, by the way, in an area in an empty area accessible from the utility corridor. But how are they working on these things without their absence being noted? Well, in, they had like dummies. They had like, I don't know, just pillows under the sheets, right? Or something <laughs> like super cliche. Well, in yet another strand of the plan, they also constructed dummy heads out of anything they could get their hands on, including toilet paper, toothpaste, soap, and cement powder. They also used paint from prison supplies to give them a slightly more lifelike color, and even managed to snag hair clippings from the prison barber to stick onto the tops. While these dummy heads had been described as crude, I'm pretty impressed, and I doubt that I'd be able to do much better with actual real art materials, let alone random bits and bobs that I'd managed to catch from bathrooms and barbershop floors. They also obviously worked as they weren't discovered to be dummies until after, spoiler alert, the men had escaped. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, I give them a lot of credit for that. This is this is a pretty good plan. I hope these guys weren't like horrible rapist murderers or something. Did we discuss what crimes they did? Sometimes I read these and I'm like, did I just not pay attention for a second? <laughs> because now I'm kind of like rooting for these guys. They're like, yeah, you could do it. But if it turns out, it's like, no, 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 they were pedophile murderers. It's like, ah, oh, I mean, they didn't murder pedophiles. That would, you know, not be the worst thing in the world, would it? They were uh, murderous pedophiles. Then I'll be like, I hope these guys don't escape. <laughs> At 9.30 p.m. on the 11th of June 1962, after six months of preparation, it was decided that the time was right to make an escape attempt. Morris and the Anglins planted their trusty dummy heads in their beds, crawled into the utility corridor, and covered up their escape holes with the painted cardboard. Unfortunately for Alan West, he hadn't needed to leave his cell to make the rafts, and stuff as had been tasked with smaller items such as the paddles and the life preservers. I've seen a photo of a recovered life preserver or jacket, and West did some really neat work. Oh, that's good. Because of this, however, he hadn't spent as much time trying to break through the back wall of his cell, so he couldn't get out. Wait, <laughs> I feel like sure have really thought of that one through. Clarence Anglin did try and kick the vent out from the corridor side, but couldn't manage it, so poor old Alan West was left behind, while his three friends climbed into the night and the history books and disappeared. Wait, so what? Did, how did Alan West... This seems like the most obvious thing to think through. They spent months, like from 5pm to 9.30pm, digging through the concrete wall at the back of their cells and enlarging the vent space. Alan West was just like, nah, 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 I'll figure it out later. And then they left and he was like, yeah, I should have figured it out. What's up, Alan? Come on. Because the only witness to the event so far was now stuck in his cell, we can only speculate on what happened next. Gathering their rafts and supplies, Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin climbed onto the roof of Alcatraz prison and made their way across and eventually over the fence and down to the shore. Using some bellows they made from a modified concertina, which was similar to an accordion, that is amazing, guys. They inflated their raft and pushed out into the water. According to West, the original plan was to paddle the raft to Angel Island first, which is about 2.4 miles, 3.8 kilometers north of Alcatraz. Given that we only have West's uh, testimony here, 
these guys either escaped or they died at sea, right? I hope they escaped, unless they were murderous pedophiles. From there, they would head to Marin County via the Raccoon Strait, steal a car and some clothes, and head off into the sunset. So, did they make it? Well, therein lies the mystery. Alan West had eventually managed to bust out of his cell later that night. Okay, but without anyone to help him uh, climb up to the roof and with no raft, his chances were totally blown, so he sheepishly tiptoed back to his cell and went back to bed. Legends. In his future reports to the authorities on the condition that he wasn't punished for the escape attempt, West painted himself as the mastermind of the whole operation, although <laughs> I don't think so, mate. You forgot to make a hole in your cell. Although I think it's even more embarrassing that he was the only one not to make it out of his cell if he was so smart. Yes. In the movie Escape from Alcatraz, the main characters use the real names of Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin. Alan West is represented, but out of all the names in the world they could have given him, his character's name is Charlie Butt which seems like a pretty disparaging burn. Yes, unfortunate. The dummy heads, and therefore the missing men, weren't discovered until 7.15 a.m. on the 12th of June, giving them about 10 hours head start. The FBI were called in almost immediate. That is, okay, I feel like now this is getting, the others were kind of like failed attempts. This seems like pretty solid successful attempt, like a 10 hour head start. You made it. That's, that's an escape. Unless they drowned immediately, but we'll never know. So, again, it's grey. It's grey. Let's stop trying to say whether these are escapes or not. The FBI were called in almost immediately, and although in the first two days they found some sealed-up personal letters relating to the Anglins and some debris from a homemade paddle, no substantial evidence or any bodies were found. On the 21st of June, what is believed to be the tattered remains of the raft were found, and a life preserver also, also washed up the day after, but these could have been discarded after the men had already landed somewhere. Yeah, yo, yo, yo. If that is washing up and the bodies aren't washing up anywhere, like, I'm not expecting to wash up in the same place. These dudes escaped. The FBI worked the case for 17 years until the 31st of December 1979 when they officially closed their investigation and turned it over to the US Marshal Service. The US Marshal's like, what's up? Why are we getting this? It's 17 years old. You expect us to do something? Hell no! The FBI thought the men had probably drowned in the waters of the bay and never made it to shore as no trace was found of them over the years. They also decided that I mean, I kind of disagree with that. I think they escaped. They also decided that the packet of family info the Anglins had made was so valuable to them that the men could have drowned before leaving them behind. Ri <laughs> okay. Katie also writes, really? And I do dis- I, I agree with that. That really, like, what? That's what you base the case they died on? Perhaps the package just fell out of someone's pocket, or it wasn't really that valuable, and the Anglins left it behind intentionally as a red herring, or just thought, sod it, and kept on with the more important task of, you know, rowing to freedom. The U.S. Marshal Service still lists Frank Morris, Clarence Anglin, and John Anglin as wanted fugitives, and their case is still open, despite the escape having happening almost 60 years ago. Apparently, the case will close in 2030, when all the fugitives will be over 100. Oh my god, U.S. Marshal Service is intense. It's like, when do we close the the case only when we're fairly certain that they're all dead oh man what a birthday present maybe they'll have been hanging on and we'll finally all pop out of the woodwork to enjoy some very limited time as free men there's gonna be a statute of limitations right or does that not apply to escaping from prison because then it's like you haven't finished serving out the punishment that's been dished out to you but then escaping prison is a crime in itself surely there's something's going to expire there all right i'm not a liar i have no idea how any of this stuff works Maybe once you're convicted, that doesn't count anymore. So, did they all drown before even making it to their first stop at Angel Island, as the FBI thought? Well, this is by no means conclusive. As proved by 9-year-olds and 87-year-olds, it is more than possible to swim all around the islands in the Bay Area. These men were in decent shape, were no strangers to swimming, had inflated life jackets and a raft with paddles. They were also hell-bent on escaping, which tends to give impetus to whatever you happen to be doing. According, yes, like the guy swimming to the islands, you know, just for fun that summer, is going to be way less motivated than the guy swimming for his freedom. According to recent digital recreations of current patterns and virtual raft launchings, if the trio had gotten into the water about 11.30 p.m., which definitely meshed with their known timeline, they would have had a fairly easy ride up past the Golden Gate Bridge, and what's more, if they'd abandoned everything in the water when they made land, the currents would have washed it all back up on Angel Island, which is where it was found. They escaped. Just as although then they managed to like live on the run all this time? I feel like the 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 people who escape prison always get caught later. 
Just as compellingly, though, the computer model also showed that if the raft had been launched prior to 11 p.m., again with the again within the probable time frame, they probably wouldn't have been able to handle the current and would have been carried out to sea. There have been many reports of a raft found on Angel Island with footprints leading away from it, but this is literally all the information we have. Well, if they were washed out to sea, it's unlikely for it to come back in and wash up on that island, right? So it's more likely they departed later, took it to shore, and then they're right. That would make more sense. It was in a typed up FBI report with no uh, follow up. Wait, what was? Oh, the raft on Angel Island. So they found it. There was no follow up. The raft wasn't actually there. Only shreds of it were found. If the men had followed the original plan and made it to Angel Island, this would prove they landed there. If they caught a, a different current, they could have passed Angel Island altogether and gone straight for the mainland, meaning that the footprints were not theirs and were just coincidentally close to where the debris washed up. The lack of bodies is also kind of a point in their favor, although at least two other escapees drowned without their bodies being recovered. How do you know? People known to have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge have also never been found, despite recovery operations being quickly launched. The currents really can be treacherous, and if you're caught in one and end up being pulled out to sea, the chances of rescue or recovery are very, very slim. There was a body found floating after the escape in what was apparently the prison garb of shirt and denim trousers, although it wasn't spotted until over a month later, and the boat that spotted it didn't get that close and didn't even report it until October. What are you up to? By the time it was recovered, it had deteriorated to the point of no longer being identifiable, if it was even the same body at all. While some people thought it must have been one of the three, others thought it might be the body of a much more recently deceased man, and that it was unlikely that the body would still be floating four months later. The jury's out on that one. Don't we know that? I mean, don't they have those death farms or whatever they call them? Probably not death farm. There's like uh, where they do experiments with dead bodies to see how fast they decompose and stuff. I'm fairly sure I made a video about it on some other channel I do. And they, you know, just to see. Surely they've put a body in a tank and been like, well, four months with some salt water. Is that body still going to be there in four months of like being washed around? Or is it just going to be disintegrated into various pieces? I feel like it's not going to last like four months, right? There's going to be like a skeleton left. And th also fish will eat the body and all that nasty stuff. It's also unlikely that the men had any outside help, like a boat picking them up or a rendezvous with a friend or family member. For one thing, it would be almost impossible to arrange anything like that, being stuck on a rock and all. Also, they seem to have decided on the spur of the moment to make their escape that night, meaning that if anyone was enlisted to help them, they would have been hanging around every night for a long time for the men to make their move. Unknown boats weren't allowed anywhere near the island, and the Anglin family, who are farm workers based in Florida, didn't have the ways or means to help their brothers out. Morris was an orphan with no other family to call on, and even if they did have associates willing to help out, the three had been moved to California, far away from their previous networks. Well, they're missing out on one of those like famous tropes of prison escape movies. You've got to bring someone in who's like in the mafia or like super rich or something, because they're the guy who has the contacts on the outside to like arrange the car or the plane to pick people up. Look, I've learned a lot from the TV show Prison Break. You gotta bring on what was the dude's name? The mafia guy? The gang guy? I don't remember. But he was the one who arranged their plane. So what other evidence do we have for their survival, apart from just hoping that these scrappy underdogs managed to stick it to the man? Yes, I know they were all hardened criminals, but after all that effort, you've got to root for them a little bit. Okay, let's root for them. Assuming they're not murderous pedophiles. There were several sightings over the years, including a tip that Clarence Anglin was living at large in Brazil in the mid-1960s. The FBI did even go and check this out, or maybe it was just because it was a thin excuse for holiday. I'm like, if I was in the FBI, some guy was like, yeah, 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 we've really heard that he's having an absolutely wonderful time at the Four Seasons in Brazil. Be like, well, we better go check out that Four Seasons resort and hotel, better not we? Because, I mean, we've got to make sure. I think about two and a half weeks would do it nicely. But nothing came of the sighting. The Anglin family was extensive, with Clarence and John being two of 13 or 14 children. Their mother played down their place in her affections by bemoaning their criminal activity, but it may just have been a facade to keep their whereabouts a secret. At the beginning of the search, the Anglin family was, understandably, under huge scrutiny and pressure from the FBI. They probably didn't have anything to do with the escape attempt or much knowledge of where the men were, but if they did, they certainly didn't spill it. As the years have gone by, however, it seems that they are more amenable to getting the record set straight. A few members have said that Clarence and John's mother received roses and signed cards from her missing sons over the years, and that as a family they all believed the brothers had successfully escaped. There was even a Christmas card sent to their mother the first year they escaped, signed by John. There were rumors of a suspiciously disguised pair turning up at the funerals of both their mother and father, but presumably no one snitched on them at the time. Yeah, all of this is just super circumstantial and in my mind isn't really important. It's, I don't know, you can't rely on all of this stuff to, to 
to show that something's true it's super circumstantial one of their other brothers robert apparently admitted on his deathbed that he had been in touch with both clarence and john a few times when they were on the run and john's nephew david wilder has been quoted as saying we have a lot inside the family that we haven't shared how infuriating but it does give a spark of hope to the survival theory well I'll just wait until they're over 100 and spill the beans what was that happening in 2030 I, I don't know if anything will happen but it'll be exciting i reckon they escaped i truly do the fbi tried to pour more cold water o- uh, over the escape by saying that no cars had been reported stolen in a 12-day period after the escape in the area they, they were looking in but a documentary made by national geographic in 2011 said that a car was reported as stolen the, stolen the morning that the escape was discovered and this was backed up by reports in at least two newspapers at the time <laughs> Shit, national geographic you are digging into it the fbi are like no 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 car thefts national geographic is all contraire fbi how do you i guess those records are like public because it's super old also i guess like theft and, is this public i don't know another tick in the survived column is that a friend of the anglin family fred brizzy claims that he had met up with the anglin brothers in brazil in 1975 fbi wants another holiday <laughs> and they had a photo to prove it in the picture which from the shirts they were wearing could only have been taken in the 1970s two men wearing sunglasses are standing on either side of a termite mount a bit odd but these were apparently clarence and john anglin in the flash and expert photo analysis carried out has since confirmed that the photo is a genuine one from the 1970s as recently as 2020 advanced facial recognition technology was done was used on known photos of the anglins and compared them to the men in the photo the company that ran the project rothko has said that as far as they're concerned the men in the pictures were most definitely the anglins okay well i mean like yeah that kind of settles it right well let's carry on well old fred brizzy had form as a con man and was known to tell tall tales yeah but i mean that just if the forensic photo analysis shows that they're the same people then the forensic photo analysis shows they're the same people his own wife had never heard the story of when he met up with the famous escapees in rio so maybe he was just making it all up although the photo for me is quite strong evidence yeah fully agree it's it's very strong evidence it didn't even surface until 2015 as brizzy may not have wanted to cause trouble for his friends so he didn't send it on to their family members for many years also while photographic evidence may be enough in some cases it could still be two men who just bear very strong resemblances to future versions of the anglins yeah but this, they proved the photos accurate they both look really like them what are the odds stranger things happen all the time yeah but this isn't strange this is just evidence <laughs> they are wearing sunglasses in the photo which might throw off the facial recognition software a bit and the picture is not the clearest that it could be and of course the company carrying out the project would be courting as much publicity as it possibly could also the picture is all there is there's no conclusive dna evidence or written confessions to go with it yeah but it's still fairly compelling isn't it in 2013 the police in san francisco received a letter purportedly from john anglin himself in the letter he says that when they made the escape they all barely made it to shore and that frank morris had died in 2005 and clarence had died in 2008. he also said he was 83 had cancer and needed treatment so threw a deal out there of turning himself in in exchange for a maximum of one year in jail and medical treatment the letter was not made public for years and the u.s marshal sent it to the fbi for forensic and handwriting analysis the results were not conclusive but john could have had someone else write it for him and also a person's handwriting probably changes a bit over the course of five decades if it wasn't him but just some canny old cove trying to get healthcare in exchange for a year of free living and three square meals a day well more power to him it really says something about the u.s healthcare system yeah this is insane that people are prepared to spend a year in jail in exchange for getting treated for an increasingly common illness the claim wasn't investigated any further and nobody john anglin or fake john anglin got taken up on the offer oh that's such a shame that would have been cool i mean not cool it's a horrible situation to be in that you have to exchange prison time for cancer treatment but uh, it would have been nice to know the like a definitive conclusion to the story several people have confessed helping the trio carry out their escape over the years but they've all been dismissed as just lies basically with no concrete evidence for or against the three having made it 
It's all just noise at this point. Yeah, like this is the similar looking people in at the funeral. It's all just nah, noise. While it does seem at least possible that the group could have made land and driven off into the sunset, what does make it slightly less probable is they were never heard from again. They were wanted men, their faces everywhere, and they had all been lawbreakers from a very young age. Sure, they had the best reason to stay under the radar for a while, but would they really be able to keep their noses totally clean for the rest of their lives? Maybe heading to another country would have afforded them the extra layer of anonymity that they needed. While they may have been familiar faces in the US laying low in Brazil in a time before everyone had a camera and a phone in their pocket would definitely have been a simpler proposition than it would be today. Yeah, I mean, and also wearing the sunglasses be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a wanted criminal, so in, in photos I wear big sunglasses. <laughs> Fairly sensible precaution. There haven't been any leads or credible sightings regarding Frank Morris, but if the letter is to be believed, he also survived and kept in touch with the brothers until his death in 2005. Officially, Frank Morris, Clarence Anglin, and John Anglin are recorded as missing and presumed drowned by Alcatraz Records, but I think there's more than enough to, sh uh, to uh, more than enough stray threads to cast doubt on the official version. And it does seem that the feds were just a bit useless in this instance, especially if the photo of the brothers in Brazil is actually them. They got the Brazil tip years earlier but failed to find any trace of the escapees. So maybe they chalked the whole thing up to a presumed drowning to save face rather than admit they were outwitted by three men and a bunch of raincoats. In 1964, shortly after the amazing escape and John Paul Scott's swim to almost freedom, Alcatraz was closed due to high running costs and crumbling infrastructure. In 1969, in a rare show of unity, protest group Indians of all tribes occupied Alcatraz for over a year and a half, bringing attention to Native American issues, sparking activism, movements, and calling for the island to be returned to the Native Americans now that it was no longer being used. As time went on, accidental deaths and infighting spelled the end for the protest, as well as the government cutting off power to the island. It officially ended in June 1971. Alcatraz became part of the Golden Gate National Recreational Area in 1972 and opened to the public as a tourist attraction in 1973. I have to say, I'd love to go and see that. It sounds pretty fascinating. Thanks to its rich history, it became a National Historic Landmark in 1986. Now you can visit the island by ferry and see for yourself where John Angling cut his way out of his cell and possibly into a new life. That is cool. I'd like to see that. I have to say that while it started off as wishful thinking that the men might have made it after all their careful, careful and ingenious planning, with this new evidence that's been trickling out from the Anglin family and the discovery of that photo, Alcatraz may have to grit its teeth and finally mark a three in the escaped column after all. Yeah, I have to say, normally, I mean, that's the end of Katie's script, by the way. Normally, I'm, if you're regular to this podcast, I'm usually fairly skeptical about all of this stuff. And I'm like, ah, well, yeah, probably not. But this one, I'm kind of like, yeah, I think they escaped. I'm kind of into it. I think they escaped. I think that letter, I don't know if it was genuine, but it seems just bizarre enough to be. Uh, but nah, it's kind of noise. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm kind of into it. I'm persuaded by this one. Great script, Katie. Thank you. Thank you uh, listening at home or watching or however you consume this. If you do want to give it a like and subscribe to this channel, if you're watching on YouTube, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. If you're listening to it as a podcast, a five-star review, wherever you get your podcasts, especially Apple Podcasts, by the way, because they're like their podcast ranking thing the more reviews we get the more it gets up there and people see it which is nice I, I like that it's obviously nice when more people listen to the show for me at least encourages me to make more this uh that would be great thank you so much and as always i'll see you in the next episode <laughs>